Hey everyone, Burundus. It is now 2021. What is it like? Uh, well, more than a year since the last time I made one of these, and I know there's been a lot of interest. Uh, I've kind of avoided getting into these systems videos just because uh, there's still some work to be done, uh, but I thought people might be interested in uh, hearing a little bit of my usual ramblings about systems and tech talk uh, from the left side of the cockpit. So I think when I left you off back in 2020 with the number four vid that I did, we had gone through a painfully slow startup um, on the right side, so the pilot side. Uh, so I'm not going to go through a startup sequence here. Uh, I'm going to talk about the left side of the cockpit. Um, so we'll start with a cold aircraft and kind of go through the methodology that I used uh, with my, my previous vids. I don't think this is going to be an hour, but you know, knowing me, it probably will end up being well more <laughs> than I'm expecting. Uh, I'll just kind of talk through uh, all the switchology. Um, and so one of the issues is that the left side of the cockpit isn't integrated in yet and some of the symbology and things so I'm not going to go too far in depth into actually bringing the system up because what you'll see uh, isn't correct and it's not integrated I can't work stuff from the left seat yet but I will go through all the button presses and what the equipment is on this side of the cockpit for those that are interested um, you can listen to the soothing sound of my voice as I once again, uh, just talk about each, each switch in detail and then what the equipment actually does. So I hope you enjoy it and I'll just kick it off right here. Uh, so obviously we're on the left side of the cockpit here. So cold aircraft um, and I'll just kind of start from, from the left to the right. Uh, won't talk through circuit breakers or anything like that like I did before. None of that's different. Um, so just a quick overview of the cockpit here. Uh, starting with the CSC and the communications uh, select and control panel which is the same as the pilots panel if you remember down here on the uh, center console so this piece of equipment is the same as this piece of equipment uh, this control hat right here I'll zoom in just a little bit and you'll have to forgive my my lack of high-tech uh, YouTube and DCS um, recording skills so I'm just doing this in 2d with a mouse so um, zooming in you know with the mouse so everything will look a little bit jerky etc so deal with it um, all right so this button right here is the same as the one that's on the uh, basically the same function as the one that's on the collective so this function right here if you remember uh, when the CSC in the right seat is set to um, remote all the functions from this control head are transferred to the uh, the pilots collective and he can control all the radios uh, radio selection and channeling and um, frequency selection uh, from these two switches right here. That feature is not available in the left seat. The CPO or the Copilot Observer has to do all his comms functions kind of the old school way or as you would in the in the Huey um, by selecting your channels up and down and your uh, activating your keyboard and your frequency uh, by using this button right here. You actually select the radio that you want to talk on by rotating the radio select knob right here. So as this rotates you can put it in ICS and when you press the push to talk on your cyclic uh, all it will not transmit outside of the aircraft. So uh, regardless of what you do if your rotary knob is in ICS you're only getting ICS put it in position one that's the FM1, position two is the UHF, position three is the VHF, four if installed would be the SATCOM and five is FM2. There's no remote function so this is uh, not utilized. Uh, this knob over here if you're in hot mic you can uh, no matter what you do the, the mic is always active so that's not really preferred especially doors off because it kind of blows everything out all the time. So we like to use Vox um, which is a voice activated again same as the pilots CSC and then normal means that uh, you have to actually press the push to talk switch 
either to the first detent or the uh, to get intercom. Um, so the mic is not activated until you press the first detent on the push to talk switch, which gets you the intercom function. And then ICS off just turns everything off. You don't hear anything in your headset, nor can you talk at that point. Your Vox sensitivity is right here. So if you have the rotary knob selected to Vox on, you can adjust the sensitivity of the voice act activation right here. Uh, the master volume is this rotary knob, and then your um, individual volumes for the radios on the pins here. So these correspond to the radios FM1, UHF, VHF, SATCOM, and FM2. Um, your nav functions aren't really... So th this would be if you were using this control head in a different aircraft that had an NDB, you could uh, adjust the NDB volume when you're receiving on that frequency, but we don't use it here. Uh, the mic, again, just to reiterate, uh, selects either uh, two different styles of microphone pickups. So uh, really, this never changes. You don't really mess with that. It, we always use the same type, so it's just set to microphone style number one. Uh, so when the CPO wants to talk, he has to rotate this knob. So let's say I want to talk on UHF. I rotate it up to the number two position, and uh, provided I'm on the correct frequency, then I pull the trigger on my uh, cyclic push-to-talk switch, and I can transmit out. If you pull, so these are also also uh, push and pull capable. So not only do they rotate, but you can pull it out. And if you pull it out. Uh, you are silencing that radio in your headset. So that's a way to sort of uh, isolate a radio that you want to listen to exclusively. So if you pull all the pins, you're not hearing any radios unless you have the rotary knob selected to that radio. So regardless, um, if you have all the pins pulled, if you have your rotary knob selected to a radio, you will always hear that radio. But you can adjust the volumes individually. And then the master volume is kind of self-explanatory. So what we do if we're talking on two FMs, the Victor and the Uniform, like the left seater is concerned mostly about talking to the ground units um, or the, the greater flight if he's the AMC. So he may turn down or pull the UHF and VHF pins if those aren't necessarily important to him while he's trying to isolate uh, a conversation on FM1 or 2. You can pull those pins and get rid of that talky talk on those uh, radios to listen in and then if you're smart you push it back in so that you don't miss anything. Alright so that's the comm functions in the left seat. Moving on to the MMS control function. So this is the MMS control panel right here and uh, when you're using the MMS um, the laser functions and your TV and IR camera gains and sensitivities and focusing functions are all done through here. The most important um, switch on this panel is the uh, MMS rotary select switch. So, so this is a rotating, uh, let's see, I don't think I can actually manipulate this. Nope, it's still it's still static. So this is what controls the functions of the MMS right here. Obviously, it's an off right now. If I rotate this to stow, what it's going to do is, uh, while it's operating, it's going to be in one of the operating modes. You always have to stow it, but you don't ever want to go directly to off. If you go from an operating mode, or in other words, if the MMS is on and you go directly to off, um, it loses its... Uh, loses some algorithms in the software and it's bad for it. So then the maintenance guys have to come out and uh, sometimes it dumps them, sometimes it doesn't. But you go to stow and it rotates the MMS to the stow position on top of the mast, which puts it in the uh, 180 degrees uh, backwards looking and somewhat down. I believe it goes to the, all, the full down, 30 degrees look down. And that's where it um, shuts down the gyros and turns off the stabilization systems and once you get a stow complete it'll show takes about 30 seconds or so you get a stow complete and then you can go ahead and rotate the mode select switch to off 
pre-flight is how you access a lot of the um, functions in the MMS that allow you to change some of the airborne calibration functions. It's a lot of not only maintenance stuff, but there's, for instance, if your bore sights are off uh, or if you have to uh, adjust some of the values in the pre-point constraints, um, some of the biases that are in there, you would go to the pre-flight page and then it brings up a bunch of functions where you can get into some of the more detailed configuration pages that you wouldn't normally do while you were on mission. So um, when you turn the MMS on and there's sort of a rhythm to it, you go one click, two click, three clicks, and you kind of pause in between them. Um, and that gives the computer basically a chance to recognize where it is. But you would go from off when you're turning it on to forward and then just kind of wait. And as the system brings itself to life, uh, in order to bring it from the stowed position, you would hit the manual slave switch. And I'll talk about that in detail when we get to that. So the all the MMS control functions um, are on the left or the CPO cyclic which if you recall is different than the right side so it's it's the same shell but the buttons and functions are different and like I said I'll go into those in detail when we get to that the pre-point okay so it's important to understand how this switch works let me kinda just baseline this for everybody so uh, I'll continually refer this as the MMS mode select switch. Uh, and basically how you need to think of the MMS is being slaved to functions. So when I say slaved, there's the manual slave button right here. And this controls whether the MMS is in the manual mode or the slaved mode. When I say slaved, it will be slaved to either manual or slaved to one of the operating functions right here. So off, stow, and pre-flight are not used in flight generally. And then you have pre-point mode, forward mode, and search mode. So talking about each of those individually. When you have the MMS mode select switch in the pre-point mode, you have uh, up to five waypoints and a manual waypoint that you can designate as pre-point. Um, I shouldn't say waypoints because that uh, crosses over into um, terminology for navigation, but positions. It can be either waypoints, control points, or targets that are in your uh, nav system, and you can pre-point to those items. So you can pre-point to, let's say, 2W, which is a waypoint, or you can pre-point a target, or you can pre-point a control point. And just to review, there's 99 waypoints, 99 targets, and 20 control point positions available for you to fill. So if you just uh, lazed and stored and target located a target on the battlefield, you can designate it as a pre-point target. And then with the manual slave button, you can slave it to the pre-point target of your choice. And what that will do, it will, the MMS will, using the EGI system, uh, will pre-point or point to that target. And it will continue to point in the area of where that target is. It is not point tracked to it. So in other words, you are not locked on that target. The MMS is just pointing where the target is. From the slaved to pre-point mode, once the MMS is slewed over to where you want it to look, uh, then you have to take it out of slave to pre-point, put your MMS cursors with the LOS or line of sight control switch on the cyclic, put your uh, target designating cursor over the target, and then hit your point track button, which is also on the cyclic. So this is something that's easy to confuse. Um, so when I say I'm slaved to pre-point, that means the MMS is looking in the close direction of a target waypoint or control point that I have designated as that pre-point stair point and when it's slaved to pre-point it's looking at it but it is not point tracked so it is not sufficient to launch a guided munition on a pre-point target uh, and part of the reason for that is that it's not super stable so 
keep in mind this is so this is ni late 1980s technology so there is not the um, it's using internal data uh, such as the ring laser gyros and some calculations that it uh, got from the target location and the stabilization of the site is such that it will bounce around around that target just so it's not super stable so in pre-point mode that position that you're looking at on the earth will be moving around a little bit in your in your picture on the on the screen once you take it out of slaved to pre-point and slave it to manual the stabilization algorithms come in and then you get that nice steady picture so when you are finding your target and you always want to keep the site oriented on that target you can be slave to pre-point no matter what you do with the helicopter the site will always slew around independently to sort of look back at your target but you wouldn't want to launch a, a laser guided munition while you're slave to pre-point because the site's moving around and most likely it's not going to hit so in order to get that good steady laser energy on target you're going to want to slave it to manual and then either point track the target or just manually keep the, the crosshairs on the target. So that's a kind of a complicated way of looking at it, but it's important to understand that concept. All right, so then go into forward mode. So uh, if you are slaved to forward, that means that the MMS is basically stowed in a zero elevation and zero azimuth position. So if you're just flying around and you're not using the site, you always want to rotate your MMS mode select switch to forward and then slave it to forward. And basically that just stows it forward, so it's staring forward. Um, once you want to manually control it again, then you got to unslave it from forward with the manual slaves button and slave it back to manual control and then the LOS switch becomes active again. Once we get into making some live videos I'll talk about uh, how the stabilization function so we'll see if we implement this but in the in the real aircraft and I know merely by me saying it you guys will want to see the kind of ways you can screw yourself uh, in the real aircraft in the DCS module but uh, just for trivia so you can actually break if you are slave to forward you can actually press on the MMS LOS switch and it will break out of forward but the stabilization algorithms will not be active so you are still slave to forward and the way you know that you are slaved to a function is it will indicate on the uh, lower center of the MFD uh, so whatever you're slaved to so you'll always want to look when you are trying to find a target you want to look for man down here for manual and I'll, I'll bring the uh, MMS up uh, to talk about through this so I'll, I'll put some power to it and then uh, look in the right side um, right now we're just talking about switches so if you're slave to pre-point you would always see PRPT down here if you're slave to manual you would always see manual down here and if you're slave to forward you would always see FWD down here if there's nothing that means uh, but you have control of the site in other words you can tell the site to look left right up down if you want to if you don't see manual down here you are not slaved to the manual mode which means the stabilization algorithms are not in effect and the site is very twitchy so trying to control the site uh, in the the breakout mode I'll call it without being slave to manual um, is a common mistake to make for somebody that's not super used to uh, controlling the MMS, a new pilot or a student pilot, in other words. And they'll try to be track. They'll try to track a target, and the IP will typically let them flounder around for a couple minutes as they're trying to get a nice steady target track, and then slap them on the back of the helmet and say, "Hey, man, check to see what your manual slave is. Do you see manual on the on the MFD? Uh, no. Okay, we'll slave it to manual, and then." magically everything's stabilized and they have good control of the site all right finally to search mode so this this is a you have three or four different search options you have a raster function so I'll, I'll start off by saying that we didn't use this much because all this does when you slave it to search with the search um, pattern that you have selected all it all it does is the the site will then scan in that um, search function. There's one that's kind of sort of useful if you're in a hover position, but uh, it's m 
really much more practical to just scan manually. So uh, when you s rotate the MMS mode select switch to the search mode and then slave it to search mode, you'll see SRCH uh, down here. And on the left, you'll have, uh, let me see if I can remember, there was the raster search and the pattern search. So raster search, all it does is it starts on the upper left and it goes at a predetermined pattern and it just scans back and forth like this. Looking far out to closer in if you imagine you're in a hover hold. And then it just resets and then it goes back out. And all it's doing is just scanning left to right, far out to close in. Um, if you select the um, center search pattern, the left search pattern, or the right search pattern, you can specify how many degrees left or right of center you want it to search. Let's say you want it to search 45 degrees to the left. So um, when you slave to, um, I got to remember what it's called, the center search or offset search, uh, let's say we pick offset 45 degrees left search. All it's going to do is go to zero uh, relative azimuth and then look to the left and then come back to zero and it's just going to keep going back and forth if we're slave to the offset left 45 degree search function. So not super useful. Um, it's far more useful to have manual control of the site and then actually be scanning for targets. So when I say operational modes uh, you'll hear me talk about that a lot when we go through some tutorials when we get to that point. Um, that means the MMS mode select switch is rot rotated to either pre-point forward or search operational mode. Uh, most likely we'll be using forward to manual. Sometimes pre-point um, is very useful. So you'll set up your, your desired pre-point targets and then select them on the MFD which one you want to have pre-pointed and you just hit your manual slave and it'll zip the site around to that target. Then you put it in manual mode and then you either point track or, or manual track the target that you want to get after. All right, the panel above the MMS mode select switch is the uh, video control panel. So these are functions that have to do with the MMS and MFD symbology brightness on the MMS page and the um, TIS or thermal imaging system, system gain and level and the autofocus and manual focus. All right. So the system intensity, this is just symbology brightness. So when you have the screen, the MMS page up, you can change the, um, the stuff around the periphery, uh, brightness, um, like making the, the numbers brighter in contrast to the, the background scene and then the same thing for the MMS. The MMS re refers to the, uh, the symbology that will be displayed relating only to the, uh, the crosshairs, uh, the, the point track gates, etc. So that's, that's what this does. Um, the gain and level. So gain only relates to the thermal imaging system or the TIS. Uh, the level controls the um, the brightness of the TV and the TIS image. So you, up on the switches means it's in the auto function and down means it's in the manual uh, function. This one is spring loaded down so this is the focus switch. So it's always in the manual mode. If you want to auto focus on something you can flip this switch up and it's spring loaded back down. So basically what this does is just commands the, the MMS processor to attempt to focus where the crosshairs are in the scene. So you can trigger it once, let it go and see if it works. If it doesn't, then you come up to the rocker switch above it and manually focus in and out to get a, to get a good manual focus. So you always try autofocus first and then if you can't get it to focus nice, you go to the, the manual focus. I forgot to mention, these are rocker switches. So they're three position switches or three position rockers, I, I should say, in the default or, or no input. Um, they're in the center position and then you can rocker the switch up and down for positive and negative inputs and then it always spring loads back to the center position. All right, above that is the laser control panel. So pretty clear here, uh, we have off, standby, and arm. 
So when you go to standby, it'll, it energizes the, the laser system, so it has power going to it. So you can program your PRF codes, etc. And then obviously when, you're, when you go to arm, uh, the laser is armed. Uh, the laser code list, so once you're ready to uh, go through the pre-flight procedure, you can press this button and it brings up your eight preset laser codes that you can put in. Um, so it'll it'll bring up the the def whatever's loaded from the DTC and then you can manually change it. So if I want to have you know quad ones in laser code alpha I would press alpha and then I can edit it via the MFK over here. Um, and then that allows so you can use any of those eight preset PRF codes um, during flight. First and last is a return function. So the default on uh, takeoff is you generally always use the first return. So if you think of the the PRF codes when you are using a, a designating laser, it's not a constant laser beam. That that would be a ranging laser. So uh, if you're you you have the option to range only, uh, or you can designate, which would be using one of the PRF codes that you've selected. So uh, first means that the MMS processor is going to use the first return it gets. So if you were point tracked on a target and you want to designate it, um, there's a there's many things that can cause some low confidence returns, um, and I'll talk through some of those. Um, but what you're doing with this switch is telling the processor to use the first returning signal or the last returning signal. And there's different situations when you want to um, kind of choose which one of those you you want to go through. So we call these um, um, factors that affect laser designating. So there's a few things um, that can give you a low confidence return. There's boresight error. There's obscurance on the battlefield. Um, there's uh, beam divergence. So the further away from a target you are, uh, just like a flashlight, the wider that laser is going to be at the at the um, point of impact so if you're 8Ks out it's likely that that laser beam is going to be three four or five feet wide um, and if you're trying to laser designate the top of a tank turret for instance some of that laser energy might be on the top of the turret and the rest of it may be going beyond it uh, to return from the ground that's well beyond the, t the tank um, there's jitter in the system, so keep in mind we're on a moving helicopter with an MMS that's on top of a vibrating rotor system. A lot of things going on, even though it's a pretty badass uh, gyro stabilization system in there. Uh, there is some vibration, and again, the further away from the source that you get with that laser beam, the more uh, exacerbated these factors are going to become. So where did I leave off? Jitter. Um, I'm trying to remember my acronym. So um, overspill and underspill kind of goes along with that beam divergence. So when I say overspill, again, if I'm trying to laze a certain feature of a target, let's let's say it's the top of a turret, and keep in mind, if you're in a hover hole, you're probably at 50, 60 feet hover, and if you're looking at a target five, six Ks out, think about that low aspect so there's not much angle there right so if you're pointing a laser pointer at something uh, the difference between one or two inches could mean you're missing it by 500 meters or you're hitting the target so that's overspill and underspill so overspill meaning you've got some part of your laser on the target and the rest is going over and beyond it uh, underspill would be the same thing if you are uh, lasing, let's say, on the road wheels of a track, uh, some of that laser energy is going to be uh, hitting the ground short of the target, or you may have some objects that are, uh, let's say, some trees, or uh, could be some battlefield obscurance, could be smoke from a burning target, etc. So some of that laser energy is going to be attenuated and actually hit um, stuff that's in the air between you and the target. Uh, and that would be underspill. And this is where the first last function comes along. So uh, when I'm lasing a target and my laser range would be displayed up here on the left, 
uh, and I have a, a nice sort of steady return, in other words, if my, my range isn't flickering back and forth, let's say that target is 4,570 meters away. If my laser range is 4,570, 4,560, 4,580, you know, it's plus or minus 10 meters or so, I know I've got a pretty good confidence that my laser is hitting what I want it to hit. If that range is moving around by a couple hundred meters, let's say, think about that low aspect shot where you miss by an inch, miss by a mile, uh, if some of that laser energy is going either beyond the target because uh, at range that laser hit spot is pretty large or if there's some sort of obscurant between you and the target uh, en route, you're going to be getting returns um, from both sources. So the, the MMS will pick up the overspill and the underspill. So you got to figure out like which which one you want to use. If you're getting 4570 and then 5600 meters, so it's, you know, going between 4570, 4580 and then it jumps up to 5000 meters and 5100 meters and then it goes to 4570 again. Uh, for one thing, you're going to have an MT displayed for multiple targets, but you know that that far range is probably overspill. So in that case, you would want to leave it on first and reposition your hit point. Uh, if your range is flickering between a your 4570 and then it goes to 3000 meters, let's say, because there's some smoke in between you and where the target is, uh, you're probably getting some underspill there. So in that case, you would want to go to the last return. So if it's going 4570 and then 4000, 4580, then 3900, etc., uh, flip that switch to the last return, and it will give you a higher confidence um, that your laser hit spot or that the calculations the MMS is using uh, is uh, appropriate. In all cases, if you're getting multiple returns, you're not going to want to launch a precision guided munition. So multiple returns or multiple targets means that there's more than one return being uh, received by the MMS. So you'll want to reposition either your hit point on the target or reposition the helicopter so uh, you have a better aspect on the target itself. All right, let's continue the discussion moving on to the MFD and then some of the, the MMS control functions um, below the MFD. So between the left and right side of the cockpit, the MFDs are the same. So um, control-wise, nothing is different from the right side of the cockpit. Just to review from last year, uh, manual MVG just flips the image from the grayscale uh, to the, the green scale. And these uh, are the color lightweight MFDs, which actually have color capability. However, the processors in the, in the aircraft are not color capable. So had there been some more modernized processors, we could have had color maps and things like that. But um, the video processing went through the old school uh, MCPUs or IMCPUs improved uh, master system control processors and they're not color capable. So anyway, uh, manual is grayscale and then MVG brings up the green scale. Primary and backup, just to review, so uh, each uh, side of the cockpit has to be in primary. So what that what that means is you're looking at your own side of the cockpit. Once you put it in backup, it just mirrors whatever's on the other side of the cockpit. So if I'm going from left to right, you see that both of these should be in primary. If I flip this one to backup, it's just going to be displaying whatever is displayed here. And that's because the the sides of the cockpit are controlled. Uh, generally speaking, there's some crossover be between the two MCPUs. So, and that's for redundancy. So if one of the MCPUs gets shot out or fails, uh, you still have the other one to take uh, over some of it. But you will lose the opposite screen. So if the right MCPU fails, the left side of the cockpit uh, or the left screen will go out. Um, so you would just put this in backup then and just mirror whatever the right seater is showing. So that's what that's what that switch does. All right, so let's get into uh, some of these control functions down here. 
you recall we call these the line address keys so left one through five right one through five and then b for bottom one through four the initial key here is uh, not related to aircraft functions it only flips between the video inputs going to the mfd itself so this is really only relevant on the left side of the cockpit when the l2 mum or um, I forget what L2 stands for. Mando man teaming is the current terminology for it. I forget what the L2 manned unmanned system was called. Anyway, uh, what that does, so the at the time that the Mando man teaming equipment was in the in this aircraft, it was federated. In other words, not integrated into the CDS or the cockpit. Uh, display system. It was not part of the aircraft, it was a separate system. So it had its own power supply. You had to turn it on separately. Basically it was a, a hardened Windows laptop behind the, <clears throat> the co-pilot's head, um, sitting on one of the radios behind the co-pilot, uh, and it had a cable that ran to feed this screen here. And you would hit the initial key to switch between the video feed from the manned and manned teaming uh, display back to the aircraft display. So if you hit this switch with the man, you could see the video feed from, let's say, the Shadow or the Gray Eagle or the B1 or whatever you were pulling the video feed in from, uh, but you would not be seeing it, all your line address keys in that case would be non functional because all you're doing is looking at video from the, from the L2 MUM or the uh, MUM T. Um, you hit the switch again to put it back to the the CDS feed. So that's that's all this does. It should not be confused with the initial button over in the in the right seat, which is down here, uh, which is brings you back to your initial page. So I almost want to delabel this because it it's going to confuse folks when you get back in once if you don't know what you're looking at. Uh, so this is. This is, brings you to the initial page when you're looking at the aircraft CDS. This is just, I don't know why they labeled it this way because it's, it's super dumb. Um, flips you back between the available video feeds uh, and in the right seat this is non-functional because you couldn't look at uh, the L2 mum feed from the right seat unless, no I take that back, the backup wouldn't work because um, that L2 mum feed in the in the left seat is not even running through the uh, CDS processing, so you couldn't even back it up on the right seat. All right, so the panel below the MMF here, bunch of stuff to talk about here. Let's get into the weeds, shall we? All right, so I'll start up uh, important ones for flight. So the ones that you use most often, um, so the equivalent to the initial, the round initial key on the right side, which you use hundreds of times per mission to get back to your initial page, is this toggle switch here. Uh, so this, when you toggle this down, and this is spring load to center, uh, when you toggle this down it does the same thing, it brings up your initial page on the MFD. And that that's the page you can start at to go to a lot of the different um, functions that uh, it's the starting point for all your pages, put simply. IDM brings up your improved data modem pages. So when you want to talk on TAC Fire or JVMF, um, the, that brings up the configuration page for it. Now JVMF is, uh, I don't even know if I want to get into it because it's a, another one of those systems that was put in place uh, later in life in the KW and it's not accessed the same way so it's almost a federated system but we had something called the the hog menu or the hands-on grip menu and it's actually brought up through a button press um, on the cyclic instead of the old TACFIRE software that was part of the CDS itself so it's a, it's a bit confusing. Um, IDM later in life in the KW and the version that you're going to be getting doesn't do much other than bring up the TAC fire or the legacy uh, <clears throat> digital comms protocol pages which you won't use and they're not going to be implemented in the game because it's a it's an outdated version of the digital comms suite. Remains to be seen how much we can implement um, if at all 
the digital comms functions. So I know that some of the other modules in DCS, such as the A10 and the and the Shark, have some limited versions of digital comms. So um, something that remains to be worked out. Uh, so the one that really that you'll use most often is pressing this switch down to get to your initial page. This here is the encryption for the feed for the L2MUM or the man, another otherwise known as uh, MUMT. Uh, if that feed is encrypted, you flip the switch up. If it's not, you're in bypass and it's, a, and it, it's an unencrypted feed. Really, that's all that does. All right, talking about other MFD functions, the weapon and the ASD page. So similar to this, it's a three position spring loaded center toggle. If you toggle it up, you get to your weapons configuration page. If you toggle it up again, it goes to the left page. Toggle it up again, it goes to the right page uh, of your weapon system to look at it. Keep in mind, you don't have the capability to actually fire the weapons from the left seat. What the left seater does is run the MMS and track and designate targets and the right seater and configure the hellfire, etc. The right seater just um, points the aircraft in the right direction and presses the fire switch. But this brings up the pages that allows you to manipulate the, the weapon settings. If you toggle it down, you get to the ASC page and you get to the ASC configuration pages. All right, the rest of this stuff all relates to MMS functions. <clears throat> so I'll take these uh, in order. So ALF GAL, this is automatic low frequency gain limitation. Uh, and it's either on or off two position switch. So what this does uh, is only relevant to the TIS or the thermal imaging system and it's used to limit the gain or the dynamic range of the sensors in the MMS so that if you have a high dynamic range um, image or target that you're looking at, for instance a burning tank, if you're trying to track a burning tank and it's on fire or there's a fire nearby, the sensors in the or the thermal sensors in the site are going to be blown out by that very hot contrast between the background and let's say that burning piece of equipment or fire or whatever. So the Alfgel switch will allow you to uh, it desensitizes or limits the gain range on those sensors. So it will basically blend down the contrast between the highest um, temperature input on the screen and blends it down to or limits the dynamic range so that you can so that the rest of the picture isn't blown out then so it basically it's an automatic way of trying to improve your picture when you're looking at a very hot object and it's blowing out the rest of the the rest of the background so that's either on or off tis integrate also either on or off. So what this does, and again, it's only for the thermal imaging, imaging system. It basically takes uh, multiple frames and overlaps them on one another. So if you are having trouble resolving a particular uh, scene while you're viewing it in TIS, uh, you can turn TIS integrate on and it will just take multiple uh, images and overlap them on one another. This only works if you have an ex a very steady not moving the site at all because if you move the site you're going to be overlapping images that are not the same and so that actually makes the picture worse. So you want to be point tracked uh, with a very stable hover and then you can turn TIS integrate on and it just uh, takes a, a rolling shutter type of snapshot and just overlays the images and eventually you'll get um, something better that you might be able to help identify what it is you're looking at. Once you start moving again you need to turn it off because if it's left on while the while the picture is moving it's just going to turn to garbage pretty quickly. Alright, LMC is linear motion control. So this is an on and off. And basically uh, if you are tracking a moving target you can turn this on and it um, brings some additional uh, motion smoothing algorithms into play so that it's easier to manually track a moving target. Uh, or if you're in a high wind situation and the helicopter's moving a lot and you're just having trouble manually tracking something, uh, you want to turn LMC on uh, or any time that you intend to manually track something. You really want LMC on because it smooths out 
the rate sensitivity on the LOS control switch so that you can more easily track a uh, manually track a target. ALE is automatic leveling equalization. So this is another feature to try to uh, improve the TIS picture. Uh, due to, so I'll just say that the the processing uh, capability of the old MMS and the IMS uh, P and MSP or uh, MMS system processors, uh, you know, not the greatest. Probably um, is the equivalent of a you know 8086 computer or something like that. Um, and you have a an array of thermal sensors up in the MMS, each one of which has an, an individual gain setting. So if there's a little bit of variance between each of those thermal pickups, you can think of them as pixels, um, each of those thermal pickups don't have the same sensitivities. So sometimes what happens is you'll get some lines drawn across the picture. So as you're looking at a picture in thermal, if the pixel or if the sensor that's picking up this line of, of image has a different sensitivity than let's say the rest of these uh, it'll be brighter or darker or whatever um, so the way to equalize or improve that picture is to turn on ALE and it will basically scrub through and normalize or equalize the thermal sensitivity or the gains on each of those individual uh, pickups in the TIS or the thermal sensors um, if I'm remembering correctly I want to say it's 330 or 332 like there's there's that many different thermal pickups up in the TIS so bottom line is you turn this on and then just kind of wait and it's gonna scrub through and sort of do this uh, debugging routine where it normalizes the the gain sensitivity of each one of those sensors to improve the picture you don't leave it on all the time you leave it on for about 45 seconds and then turn it back off again because um, if you leave it on the computer is constantly trying to scrub through and so if you're moving that picture around uh, you're constantly changing the input so the computer will never have an opportunity to sort of compare one to the other so you'll want to be stabilized on an image or really on an image with almost no thermal difference so you would want to put it on open clear sky uh, so you wouldn't want to do ALE on let's say a uh, if you're tracking a car where you can see the hot engine block and then the rest of the scene is relatively cool it's going to try to normalize the hot engine block to the re to the rest of the cool scene and you're going to end up with garbage so you turn ALE on when your picture starts to degrade you find a background with very little thermal contrast and turn ALE on and let it do its magic and then turn it back off and then go back to using the MMS uh, okay, this is an important one. This is the vent knob. So you're going to get hot in the desert. You want to turn that, open up that vent. I kid, I kid. All right. So that's that's the uh, the functions below the MMS functions uh, below the left side MFD. All right. Finally, we'll finish up with the cyclic here. So once again, the cyclic. Uh, in the left side has different features and functions than the right side cyclic. So I'll start with what we can see here. Uh, the laser switch, this is what uh, fires your laser. So you, it's a momentary pre um, I keep smacking my lips, sorry. Um, this is, you gotta hold it down to fire the laser. So if you are in range mode, you press it, you get a momentary pulse of laser energy um, that is not PRF coded. I think it fires for two to three seconds and then turns itself off regardless of whether you're pressing the laser or not. If you're designating, you need to be holding that switch down. So it's it's not a case of you press it and the laser's on and you press it again and the laser's off. It is only firing when you're holding that switch down. Below it is the area track button, which I didn't talk about area track too much, so uh, I'll come I'll come back to that. That's a That's a different uh, sort of point track. It's a it's a subset of point track basically. Uh, field of view select. So this is an up down switch. So the the MMS has a couple of different field. Of, you got narrow and wide field of view. 
and then you get a couple of zooms in there. So if you want to go to wide field of view, you press this up. If you want to go to narrow field of view, you press it down and it cycles between the two. If you press it down again while already in narrow field of view, you go into the 2x zoom and if you press it down again, you go into 4x digital zoom. Digital zoom sucks because it's just taking the existing imagery that you have through the optics and um, basically just blows it up. So what you're getting is not a very good quality picture. If you're in digital zoom, in other words, if you're in 4x zoom and you go from narrow 4x and press it up, you'll go to wide field of view, but you'll still be in, in digital zoom. So you got to remember to take it out of digital zoom um, to cycle between narrow and uh, wide field of view. In the real aircraft, you almost never use digital zoom because the picture is crappy. In DCS, I suspect that uh, unless you artificially change the picture uh, intentionally, the, the zoom levels are just going to be, you know, it's already digital, so that nothing's changing there in terms of quality. So I suspect that digital zoom in DCS is going to be pretty awesome. In the aircraft, it was not. Uh, in the center is your LOS control or line of sight control. So this is a pressure sensitive switch. Uh, so the harder you press in a direction, the more rate sensitivity it gains. Uh, it does not actually move. It's like the F F16 switch. It has a very limited, like, like if you're pressing on a hard piece of rubber, that's kind of what it feels like. Um, and again, it's, it's rate sensitive. So the harder you press in the direction you want to go, the more rate sensitivity is input into the LOS control. Above that is the TV TIS switch, so this is how you switch between sensors. And below that is your uh, designate and nav update button. So nav update uh, was a navigation feature when we had the AHARS Doppler or the attitude, head, attitude and heading reference system, which was pre-GPS days. So I think I talked about this in one of my vids back in the day uh, before we had GPS when you were relying on inertial ring laser gyros and Doppler uh, to me take measurements as you're flying and then constantly do calculations to figure out where you are. Occasionally you're going to get drift or I should say you will get drift over time. Uh, the update feature of this is a holdover from the old days. So when you, s when you press that button up you enter the uh, offset laser update button. So if you are at a location you can find a known location in the MMS. Uh, for instance let's say it's a water tower and you that's a surveyed location and you know the exact location of that tower and it is in your nav system. You find that tower in your nav system or correction in your MMS you press the offset nav update function and that activates that sub menu and then you tell it uh, I want to locate to let's say that that water tower was 2W you tell it that's the target that you are referencing and then you press the laser and it finds the grid well what it does is it ranges it and compares uh, the azimuth from your present location and it does the math and you tell it uh, that's the surveyed location I want to reference. You laze it and then the aircraft knows how far and what direction it is from that target and that's the way you up update your nav system in the old days. All that to say you don't need it nowadays because we have the GPS and the embedded uh, GPS inertial system where GPS constantly updates the inertial system so that feature is redundant. So. The only thing you're concerned with is the designation button, which is where you pull that button down, which would activate the target locate. Um, so this this tooltip where it comes up as designation button isn't strictly correct. It's actually the target locate button. So when you want to locate something to be able to store the grid in your nav system, you would activate target locate by pulling this button down and then fire the laser. So what you're doing is you're telling the aircraft I want to prepare to locate a target and then um, do the math and store it in the nav system. So when you're finding a grid for a target you find it in the MMS um, 
point track it or just leave the crosshairs on it in manual mode. Um, the crosshairs, crosshairs are where your laser is going to go. You activate the target locate function, fire the laser. After the aircraft does the math, it's going to give you a target location right here with a figure of merit, which is a target location confidence value. If it's a uh, good confidence value, uh, you can hit store and then pick a position to store it in and it, you can store it in your nav system. Uh, that's what that button does. All right, so I'm going to have to switch views to go to the what's on the back side of here, but I'll continue talking about these. So the all important manual slave is this tiny little button right here. Uh, that's the button you'll be mo using most often when you're using the MMS. Uh, so as I talked about before, manual and slave. So if you are in forward mode on the MMS mode select switch um, and you are slaved to forward mode by pressing this button, you'll see FWD on the MMS in the center, which means that you are slaved to forward mode. Okay. If then you want to control the site manually, you're going to press this button again to take it out of slave mode and put it in manual mode, or I'll refer to it as slaved to manual. So think of this as the slave button. And uh, conceptually, what you're doing is you're slaving it to an operating mode or slaving it to manual mode. That's how you want to think of it. And that places, so what this does is it just activates either manual slave or whatever mode you have selected on your MMS mode select switch. If you're in manual mode with the MMS mode select switch in pre-point, when you press this to slave, that the MMS will automatically slew to whatever your pre-point point is that you have selected. And this is what screws a lot of people up. Um, one bit of trivia to talk about. <clears throat> so when you first start the aircraft, uh, once the, a the AC generator is on, because the MMS requires three-phase AC power, and you are turning the MMS on for the first time. You're going to rotate from off to forward. Uh, and then keep in mind, the last thing it knows is it was in stowed position. So really, without doing anything, just by rotating the MMS mode select switch to forward, but not pressing any buttons on the cyclic yet, the MMS doesn't know what state it's in. So it's, it's not slaved to anything. It's just has power applied to it. So the first time you press this switch, uh, you are basically putting it in the manual mode. So you're slaving it to manual. So at this point, the MMS is still going to be facing to the rear and down from its stowed position. So you've taken it from no mode, just power applied. You press this switch once. Now you put it in manual mode, but you without changing the LOS, it's still looking back to whatever position it was in from the stow position. You need to press it again to then slave it to the forward mode. So on startup, generally, you got to press this, well, each time you have to press this button twice. Uh, in training, a lot of guys will forget to do this. So uh, they'll, they'll turn the MMS on and either not press the manual slave, and it'll just be bouncing around without gyro stabilization. Um, looking backwards and they, they'll forget why it's looking backwards and they can't find anything. So on startup it's AC power verify MMS mode select switch to forward manual slave press twice. First time goes to manual mode uh, and then second time slaves it to forward which will then slew the site to zero elevation zero azimuth. From there basically you leave it alone because it takes about two minutes for the uh, thermal system to cool down. So the coolant starts flowing into the TIS uh, and it takes a couple of minutes for those sensors to be cooled enough where you can go into the rest of your pre-flight stuff to do your your bore sites uh, prior to launching out of there. Just a bit of trivia. All right. Um, this button is the SCAS release. So same as on the pilot cyclic. This, this does not change here. Uh, let's see if I can, I don't know if I can get a better view on this. Um, on the back side, let me see here. Nope, can't see it from there. Oh, 
Oh, this is a good one to talk about. I forgot to mention this before. Okay. This used to be, uh, used to be, I say, because it uh, used to be a screen capture button, which is no longer functional. Um, so you can't do screen caps anymore. But what it is now is it brings up the hog menu. And that has, I mentioned that before, that's the hands-on grip menu, which has to do with uh, the JVMF or Joint Variable Messaging Format. So when you press this, uh, when you're in, in uh, accessing JVMF, it'll bring up your JVMF hog. And if you're in a target locate, you just conducted a target locate, it brings up more features where you can basically specify more target details. So it brings up a target uh, store function. So basically it, it brings up sub menus, um, which we still have a lot of development work to do on that. Uh, so it's not really target select. It's, it has, it's a context sensitive button that does different things from different pages. Uh, it's labeled target select here because when you have an IMSP or improved MMS system processor, uh, you can designate up to six targets to track and this is how you would select those. Uh, so it's, it's context sensitive. All right, this is your trim button so this is basically the same as on the right seat so you always got to have a trim release so if you're flying with the force trim on uh, this basically interrupts the trim uh, the other important switch on this is on the back side and there's a button underneath this trigger so this is a, a rocker trigger and this is your point track button um, so you press this once your crosshairs are on the target that you want to uh, track automatically or have the have the MMS track it uh, you press this button that's point track you press it again to put it in offset track um, and when you want to break the track you hit the manual slave um, okay now set about that all right so that pretty much wraps up the uh, left seat cold controls and going through all the switchology um, I will start a, a second video just to keep this one somewhat shorter. I'll put some power to the aircraft and then talk through some of the symbology. Now keep in mind not all of it is fully developed or implemented yet. We still have quite a bit of work to do in terms of uh, integrating the left and the right side of the cockpit and then getting some of the symbology right. So I'll kind of pick and choose what I want to go through there uh, and keep in mind everything is pre-developmental right now so what you see here in June of 2021 will probably be different by the time if you're viewing this video six months from now in the fall of 21 or uh, whenever. So put that, uh, that condition out there um, stay tuned for a further video for some power on symbology discussion and then I'll do as promised I will do a uh, kind of real-time startup from the left and the right seat once we have everything implemented on the symbology correct uh, I don't want to do that kind of stuff before uh, what you will see in the final version um, is implemented because it will just uh, become outdated and obsolete if I talk about stuff that isn't necessarily so once you get to see the module for yourself. All right, with that, cheers and uh, stay tuned for the next one.